Lord. Thank him for his wonderful name. We do have a lot to be thankful for this holiday season. Amen. Things may not be the way you want it, but things are the way that God wants them. Amen. Second Kings chapter 10. Second Kings chapter 10 and verse 29. Second Kings chapter 10 and verse 29. Now, I'm going to do just a little different this evening. Um, before we get to reading, I'm going to give to you a hypothetical story. And this hypothetical story might help you to understand what we're getting ready to read and study this evening. All right, so here we go. Hypothetical story. Now, those of you that know me, you know that I work another job, and you know that I work with flooring. All right, so let's just imagine, all right, this is where we get to the hypothetical story. This is how I can relate to it. I want you to imagine that Donald Trump has hired me to lay carpet in his house. Just imagine that. I mean, can you imagine getting a phone call and Donald Trump says, I want to hire you to come and lay carpet in my house. Oh, you can just imagine that I'd be so excited going around telling everybody I'm getting ready to lay carpet in Donald, Donald Trump's house. And he tells me what he wants as far as the carpet and all of these different things. And then I show up ready to work. And I show up ready to work, and he says, whew, what's that smell? And I say, oh, I was so excited about getting to come to work here that I did not even have time to wash my clothes. I didn't even have time to take a shower. I was just so excited. I was going around telling everybody how much I liked you, how, much, how happy I was to be able to come into work. And I've just been going around telling everybody how nice you are and how uh, uh, kind and compassionate you are and how uh, uh, you, you thought a lot of me. And I, just, I didn't even have time to put on deodorant or nothing like that. I just woke up this morning so excited and I'm just coming here to work. And, okay. And then... Imagine also, he then can smell and goes, whew, man, what's that on your breath? And I say, oh, man, I was so excited with my friends last night. We were partying last night, and I was drinking alcohol, and so you can probably still smell some of the alcohol on my breath. Okay. And then I'm standing there holding a cigarette in my hand as well, and he's like, hey, wait, 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 wait. I don't want that cigarette smoke coming into my house. Don't smoke in my house. I hired you to lay carpet. I want you to lay the carpet. Okay, okay, okay. So I put the cigarette down, and then I get to work. He leaves. He comes back a little bit later, and he says, wait a minute. That's not the carpet that I ordered. I had this brown carpet pulled, picked out, and you're putting green carpet in this room, and you've got blue carpet in that room, and you've got red carpet in that room. I had brown carpet for all of this. And then I tell myself, oh, I, I know, I know, but I just thought this would look so good. I just thought that this is the way that it ought to be, that it would just kind of match. And uh, um, or even, uh, I said green. Let's, let's say it was red, white, and blue. Say I picked out carpet that was red, white, and blue. And he said, but I picked brown. And I said, oh, I know, but I just thought it would look really good to have red, white, and blue carpet there. And he says, but that's not what I wanted. And then he hears noise, and he goes, what is all that? And I said, oh, I invited some of my friends over. I wanted them to be able to see your house. And so they're walking around, and they're looking at different things. He goes, wait, what? I hired you to lay carpet. I didn't expect you to bring people in. I said, oh, I told them you were nice, and you were kind, and you wouldn't care. And I've been telling people how nice you are and how good you are. Thank you so much for hiring me. He says, listen, stop it with the thank you stuff and stop with all that. I want you to do this the way I told you to do this. And he looks at it again and he says, you didn't even seam this together at the hallway here where the doors meet the hallway. And then what would Donald Trump's famous words be? You're fired. 
And I said, but wait a minute. I've been telling everybody how good you are. I've been telling everybody how much I like you. I've been telling everybody what a nice person you are. I've just been singing your praises everywhere that I go. How could you fire me? And he says, well, listen, if I let you get away with this, he says, I've got people working all through the house. I've got painters. I've got plumbers. I've got electricians. I've got roofers. I've got everything. If I let you get away with it, then they're all going to do the exact same thing. And what what would this what would it turn out like? What would it be like? What would my house look like? Now, here's the the title of the message this evening. Is good enough good enough for God? Is good enough good enough for God? Now, here's why I gave you that hypothetical story, and we're going to see this as we look at Jehu. Here's the problem with today's Christianity. Let me just put it that way. This is the problem with today's Christianity. God has laid out in his word exactly how he wants his people to live, exactly what he wants his people to do. He's laid out in the church the way things ought to be done. He's given us an order. He's given us structure. He's given us everything that he wants us to know. God also looked down upon us and had mercy upon us when he didn't have to have mercy upon us. And he loved us and he saved our soul and he made us his servants. He didn't have to do that, but he did. He made us his servants. He's given to each one of us a job to do. Here's the problem with modern-day Christianity. It's everybody thrown aside his word, and they've said, well, I think this would be better. Oh, I don't think God will mind. I don't think he'll care. He's loving. He's compassionate. And as long as we just come to church and just praise him and we just tell everybody how much we love him, then we can just do whatever and live however. And good enough is good enough. And so I want you to think about it. Is good enough, good enough for God? Look at J uh, Jehu. Look at 2 Kings chapter 10. And look at verse 29. Notice verse 28. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. Now let me remind you of two accomplishments of Jehu. One, he cut off the house of Ahab. Now that was no small feat in and of itself. To get rid of all of Ahab's descendants, all of the ones that um, 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 were leading Israel astray. That was no small task. That is good enough in just that. Oh, so you would think. Then he also destroyed Baal. And we read about that last week, of how he invited everybody into a worship thing. And then uh, he then said, kill them all. And so all of the prophets, all prophets, all of the priests, everybody, the servants of Baal, all of them were killed. That would be good enough. So you would think. Look what the Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse 29. How be it from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them to wit, or in other words, here's, here's the point, here's the main thing, here's why, here was the thing, the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. Now we've talked about this many times before, how Jeroboam, after the kingdom was split, Jeroboam was the first king there of the northern kingdom, and Jeroboam realized that everybody was going to go down to Jerusalem, to the temple, begin praying, worshiping the Lord, and then they would say, wait a minute. What have we done? And then the kingdom would be reunited. And so Jeroboam said, wait, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a golden calf in um, the southern part of the northern kingdom. And I'm going to put a golden calf in the northern part of the, of the kingdom. That was Dan, the north, and Bethel in the south. And, and he told the people, it's too far for you to go all the way to Jerusalem. Now, again, we've talked about that from Bethel to Jerusalem. was not that far. But yet he convinced them that it was too far for them to go all the way to Jerusalem. And then, 
And again, I'll let you look it up if you want to see all of the details of it. But then he also gave them holidays, so to speak, as we would call them holidays, that correlated with worship of the Lord. He gave it to where it was very similar to what they were used to in worshiping the Lord, but that these now were different holidays. It was the same time period, same months, all of that, you know, as far as the day of the month and all of that. It was very similar, but yet it was different. And it was remembrance of the golden calf, not in remembrance of the Lord. So it was similar, but yet it was different. And we talked about that with Jeroboam some time back. Again, for the sake of time, I won't go over it all, but I'll let you look it up and read all about this. Here's Jehu, got rid of Baal, but yet kept the golden calf. He cut off the house of Ahab, but he kept the golden calf. You think, okay, well, wait a minute now. Surely, after all the good that he has done right there, that will be good enough with God. Well, let's look at verse 30. And the Lord said unto Jehu, because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart. Now you get this. God's saying you did what was right in my eyes and you did according to my heart. See, Jay, you did good. But notice this, the last part of verse 30. Here's the promise. He said, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. Now, God gave to Jehu a blessing. Gave him a promise. And we'll read on and we'll see. Sure enough, fourth generation, they were the king. Remember, Jehu, he was not royalty. Elisha anointed him, had him anointed, and he became the king. Well, now, what a privilege that was to then be able to have his children um, serve after him. Four generations would serve after him. That was the blessing. Now, with you and I, when we do something from God, for God, even giving a cup of cold water, the Bible says we'll not lose our reward. There is a blessing. There is a reward in serving the Lord in everything we do. However, is good enough, good enough for God? Just doing a little bit, is that good enough for God? Look what the Bible tells us in verse 31. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. You see, this is what I was talking about there, that hypothetical situation. If Jeroboam was a carpet layer, he brought carpet in. That's exactly what the Lord wanted. Uh, but yet, he was doing things his own way. Yes, he cut off the house of Ahab as a soldier. He had no problem with killing people. As a soldier, and that's what he had. He had no problem with killing people, executing the word of the Lord. When he said, I want you to bring judgment upon the house of Ahab, Jehu had no problem with doing that. And then cutting off all those that worship Baal. Again, that was killing people. That's where, that, and he had no problem with that as well, of being able to wipe the kingdom of that. But then when it came to the golden calf, I wonder who got to him. I wonder who started talking to him. And I wonder if Jehu got a meeting together and he said, you know, we need to bring those things down. And I wonder if somebody said, you know, let's, let's do that. We've done a lot. I wonder if somebody even came to Jehu and said, Jehu, what about these golden calves? We got rid of everything of Baal. What about these golden calves? Let's get rid of them as well. And I wonder if Jehu said, no, let's, let's just go ahead and Um, something happened. Somebody got to him, or that's the way Jehu felt himself, and somebody else was trying to change. Something to where Jehu then got comfortable with what he had done for God and didn't realize that in pleasing God, it's not just what you have done in the past for God. It's what you're doing for God right now, and it's what you're going to do for God We've got to remember that with serving the Lord. What we've done for the Lord in the past, God will not forget. And there will be rewards for that. 
but yet good enough in the past is not good enough for today. That's called resting on your laurels. The laurel was the wreath that was given to the winner of the races, and they would wear that around, and then they later could get fat and out of shape, and they'd still walk around with the laurel on there and tell people of the good old days of back when they used to be the fastest person in the whole kingdom, and they won, and they're just resting on their laurels, on their accomplishments. Um, we can't rest on what we've done for the Lord in the past. We've got to think about what we're doing for him today, and we've got to make plans for how we're going to serve him in the future Good enough is not good enough for God. God wants our all. This is why Jesus said we are to love the Lord God. We're to serve the Lord God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. That is the first commandment. It's not just good enough to do good enough. There's so many people that they go around praising God and you'll see them on social media, Facebook or whatever it is. And they're praising God for the uh, whatever it is that's come into their life. And then other parts of their life do not bring God glory. Do not bring God glory. I have seen on social media where there's women that are not dressed modestly. And yet they talk about praising God. Now, wait a minute. That's like hiring somebody to come in and put in your carpet, and they're doing their own thing. And yet they're going around telling everybody how good the person is that hired them. Wait a minute. That's good that you're telling others of how good that I am, but yet do it the way that I have told you to do it. People post on their social media cuss words and various different things like that, and then also have something on there where they're praising the Lord. What are you doing? Out of the same mouth, blessing and cursing. This, this can't be. This can't be. We are not at liberty to just do whatever we want. Our body is the temple of God. He has laid out exactly what he wants of us. He laid out exactly in the church of how things are to be done. God's the one that said that there's only men to be the priests. God's the one that said that. God's the one that said that women were to keep silent in the church. That wasn't something we made up. That's not just something Baptists just came up with on our own to keep women down. God said that. It's not upon a church then just say, ah, oh, never mind that. We're going to have a woman stand up there and speak. Wait a minute. That's like when somebody orders brown carpet, you say, no, I'm going to put in red, white, and blue. Wait a minute, that, that's not what I ordered. That's not what I wanted. And you think God is going to reward you one day when you get to heaven just because you said, but Lord, I praised you. Don't you remember? I'd go to church, wave my hands up in the air, we'd dance and shout and sing and all this. Don't you know, Lord, I told everybody how good you were to me. And God says, yeah, but you weren't doing what I said to do. This is what happened to Jehu. Four things God expected of Jehu that we read here in this passage. Cut off the house of Ahab? Check. Destroy Baal? Check. Destroy the golden calves of Jeroboam? He did it. He kept them. And evidently, he even served Baal. And here's the interesting thing as well. If you read about, and we will, we'll continue reading this. I want you to think about this and know this as we go forward. Every one of Jehu's descendants, the Bible says, they departed not from the things of Jeroboam. Every one of them also worshipped the golden calf. We'll see that as we continue on. God wanted to get rid of them. He didn't. God wanted him to walk in the law of the Lord. The law was not just for Israel and Mount Sinai. It was for Jehu. It was not just for David. It was for Jehu. It was not just for Solomon. It was for Jehu. Hey, thanks for what you say. It's not for us to say, oh, that was for, that was for Jehu. <laughs> that, that, that was what God expected of them. And, oh, we're in 2020 now. Man, I mean, this is a crazy year. Surely God doesn't expect us to follow that. Yeah, he does. Notice what the Bible says in that verse we just read there, verse 31. But Jehu took no heed. The word heed means caution. 
It means care. It means to watch for danger. Amen. It means to notice. It means circumspection. Psalm 39, 1, David said, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Psalm 119, and verse 9, wherewithal can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Wow. Why the calf? Jeroboam, why the golden calf? Why keep the golden calf? You've destroyed Baal. You've cut off Ahab. Threw Jezebel off the building here. Why, why the calf? Three reasons of why the calf. Number one, for the security of the kingdom. He believed this lie that if everybody went to Jerusalem, then they would want to reunite the kingdom. Jehu fell into that same trap, I'm sure, to where he thought, I need to keep the calves for the security of the kingdom. There's a lot of things we will allow in our life because we think if we don't allow them, then we're going to lose our friends. Listen, if you say, for example, you say, we're going to have Thanksgiving, but no beer in my house. And then people say, well, I'm not coming. There's a, you should let them go anyway. There's a lot of things we can allow for security. Well, I just don't want to fight in my family. Well, I just don't want to lose friends. Well, I just don't want to. Hey, we're no different than Jehu. Jehu said, if I take down the calves, everybody may go to Jerusalem, and then I'm going to lose the kingdom. See, Jehu, you were anointed by Elisha. God has you. He's going to keep you somehow or another. He's going to sustain you. Take down the golden calves. And so we need to identify the golden calves in our life as well and say, hey, listen, I'm not going to trust in those golden calves. Um, I'm going to trust in the Lord. Number two, it became the culture of the people. Not only for the security of the kingdom, but the culture of the people. Everybody got used to seeing the golden calves. Everybody got used to seeing them. And now it became part of their culture of having them there. And uh, all the holidays associated with it, the 15th day of the month and all this, when they would have all their, their little uh, remembrances and stuff, it became part of their culture. And so I imagine that Jehu or somebody proposing to him of taking them down, whichever the case was, somebody said, but wait a minute, that's our culture. We can't do away with that culture. Um, hey, listen, it's time to make a new culture. It's time to get back to the old culture that we had before the golden calves were ever made. That's what yeah. Jehu should have done, but oh, this now has become the culture of the people. It's become accepted. And if we're not careful, we will begin accepting the culture of our enemy. Our culture is getting more and more filthy and wicked. There's a woman that has won whatever award there is for the song of the year. And I mean, Again, I don't even know it, but I just heard him talking about it on the news. It's a filthy song. Our culture is getting discouraged. And if we're not careful, we can start accepting the culture of this world. That's what happened to Jehu. And then thirdly, it became a compromise between good and evil. It became a compromise. Jehu would look at the people that wanted to worship the Lord and say, hey, listen, I got rid of Baal. I got rid of Baal, so this is kind of a compromise. We're not going to have Baal worship. Well, Jay, why don't you go all the way to worshiping the Lord? Well, okay, I know not everybody in the kingdom is ready for that. Remember, Jay, you didn't kill everybody in the kingdom that worshiped Baal, just the servants and the priests and the prophets. There were probably still some of the people that were like, I don't have a problem with that Jay, worship. I mean, with the Baal worship. And so the calf was kind of a compromise. Okay, we can't have Baal, but how about the calf? Maybe you can come worship the the golden calf, and it became, it became kind of a, a compromise between good and evil. And again, if you and I, if we're not careful, we'll compromise. We'll look at rock music and realize, wow, that's wicked. Wow, we can't have that. And here's Christian music. And, well, I don't know if I'm ready just to commit to Christian music. And so I know what we'll do. We're going to have Christian rock. 
decide how you're going to worship God. God has said, come out from the world and be separate. It's not upon us to reach a, a compromise of where, okay, I, I want to read the Bible, but man, that King James Bible, it's got a really hard word in there to understand. There's a thee and a thou. I mean, those are hard to understand, and I don't want to commit totally to the Word of God, so what if I got one that kind of read like a modern newspaper? How about like that? Uh, I just compromised, and I got one right here. Hey, no, no, no. J.D., J.D., you got to get rid of the golden calves. You can't, you can't have a compromise here of the, the good and the evil. you gotta, you got to get rid of the, get rid of the evil. So the question is then, does it really matter? One, it does matter what you allow to remain. It does matter what you allow to remain. Um, I remember my dad talking about it after he got saved. He, he's trying to get the victory over alcohol and being a drunk. Well, you can't keep beer in the fridge. If you're trying to get the victory over, you can't. It does matter what remains. <laughs> It does matter what remains. It does matter who's still your friend. You're trying to get the victory over alcohol. You still have friends that drink. It won't be long. You'll be right back to it. It does matter what you allow to remain in your life. You can't keep it. You're trying to get the victory over or, or, or drugs or cigarettes or whatever. You can't keep some of it hanging around. you got to get rid of it. It does matter what you allow to remain in your life. J.D. Loudon golden calves to remain. Number two, it does matter how you walk. We read that at where he says, J.D. took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel. It does matter how you walk. Yes, it does matter how we live our life. It's not just enough to just praise God and then just live however well we want to do and do whatever we want to do and we just go to church whenever we want to go to church and we give God whatever we want to give God. And, and it does matter how we walk. There's a way God has said the tithe and the offering. God has said come out from the world and be separate. God has told us of who we should have as our friends and who we should abstain from um, and fellowship with. It does matter how we walk. It's not enough just to be good enough. Just be good enough. It does matter. And thirdly, it does matter if you are committed. Committed. Why do I use the word committed? Because it says there, he took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord. Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 31, the Lord God of Israel with all his Jehu was committed. I mean, he rode his chariot furiously. He came into there. He shot the king with an arrow so hard it came out of him. <laughs> Jehu was committed. I mean, he killed all of the descendants there that were in, in Jezreel, all of them in Samaria. He even killed the visitors that came up. He killed the other king. Um, he killed all of the uh, prophets and priests and everybody of, of Baal. I mean, he was committed, but he wasn't committed. Unto the Lord. It does matter if you are committed. And as I said, the Lord wants us to serve Him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. Here's what happens if you're not committed. Letter A under that. You set a precedent for your children. You set a precedent. As I said, every one of Jehu's sons, now we'll see this as we go on, each of the generations, the successive generations, until they're cut off, each one of them worship the golden calf. Each one of them. So it's important for us to cut off the golden calf. Or otherwise we're telling our kids, it's okay to have the golden calf. It's okay. Notice what happens then in verse 32. In those days, the Lord began to Cut Israel short. Remember I said this, that God was giving Israel a second chance. He was resetting the nation. Killed off both the kings, north and the south. Brought in a man that was zealous for the Lord. Remember, Jehu was zealous, but he just didn't wholly, with all of his heart, follow the law of the Lord. Um, resetting Israel, and because this God had the plan 
in its place here. That was going to happen. Notice this. And Hazael smote them in all the coast of Israel. Yes, remember we talked about Hazael. He was the captain of the Syrian army. Remember him? Hazael. And let me back it up. Do you remember Elijah was told by God to anoint Jehu and to anoint Hazael. And then that's what was given to Elisha. Why? Because God knew what would happen. And so God had the man anointed and set as king that was going to bring the ultimate judgment then upon Israel. Or just not the ultimate, but another step of the judgment upon Israel. Obviously, eventually, Nebuchadnezzar carries him off into captivity. Um, but it, it, Hosea, God had anointed him to be the king there. And remember, Elisha wept. When you read that, Elisha wept because he says, I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do. And notice how why the, notice where the, let me just put it this way. Notice where the destruction took place. Verse 33, from Jordan eastward. I want you to picture this. Jehu has his kingdom in the main part of Israel. Here is the Jordan River. On the east side of the Jordan River. On the east side. If you're looking at your Bible map, you see the Jordan River. And picture, on the east side of the Jordan River. Hazael comes. Remember, that's where Jehu was when he got anointed to be the king. Remember that? He was on the east side of the Jordan River. And then he rode all the way over there to become the king and uh, 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 do exactly what Elisha had told him to do. What did Jehu do? He never even sent soldiers over there to help the east side of the Jordan River. He just protected the mainland. He wasn't totally committed. The Bible tells us that if we're faithful in that which is least, we'll be faithful in much. Because Jehu was not faithful in the little things, he then looks at the east side of the Jordan and goes, yeah, we can let that go. We still have a lot of land here. But Jehu, those are your people. They're the ones that chose to live over there. You know how many men we could lose if we send them over to battle over there? And so does it matter if you're committed? Yes, because you're going to set a precedent for your sons and let her be. You're not going to fight for all of Israel. And this is what happened with Jehu. You're not going to fight for all involved in your life. You've got to be totally committed. Notice what happens there in verse 32. I'm sorry, verse 33. The land of all the land of Gilead, the Gadites, and the Reubenites, and the Manassites, from a rower, which is by the river Arnon, even Gilead and Bashan. Wow, all of that. Killed by Haziel. Jehu, you are a mighty man. Go fight and defend them. No, he's staying over here protecting the golden calf. Verse 34, now the rest of the acts of Jehu and all that he did and all his might. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jehu slept with his fathers and they buried him in Samaria. And Jeho, Ahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. And the time that Jehu reigned over Israel and Samaria was 20 and 8 years. In closing, let me remind you about the churches of Revelation. We won't take time to turn there. But the churches of Revelation, every one of them did something good. Every one of them. But you know what God would say? I be it I have somewhat against you. Why? Because good is not just in him. It's God. He wants us to be totally committed. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to be totally committed. Lord, I pray that you will help Christians all across this country to, to realize that good enough is not just good. Lord, we need to be committed to you. We need to walk in your law with all of our heart. Bless us. Help us. Forgive us for where we fail. Lord, we know that we're going to fail, but Lord, help us to be strong, striving to walk according to your law. Thank you for loving us and making us your children. Help us as we serve you. Bless. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you.